Hi everyone, in this tutorial I'm going to show you my 10 top tips for painting fur in acrylics. So tip one, and that's to work on a smoother surface. Now there are a couple of brands that I like to use and there are instances where I will prepare my own canvases to get that surface slightly smoother and we'll get to that in a couple of moments. But if you're trying to create photorealism like what I am here, just showing this real time snippet of a Cocker Spaniel painting I did a couple of years ago, you can see that my details here are nice and smooth. I've allowed for many layers as well, that's another thing, in order to build up all of that depth but still have all of your details at the various levels looking nice and smooth is all down to the canvas or the surface that you use. And there are two main brands that I like to use for my pre-stretched canvases and on the left here you have Fredericks and it's their blue label and on the right recently I've been trying out the Windsor & Newton professional cotton smooth canvases and they're the ones with the pink labels. So these two are my preference to start with because they don't need any preparation you can just use them straight from the packet because their canvas is naturally already smooth. However if you've got a canvas and the surface is a little rougher than you would like you you can apply a layer of gesso, wait for that to dry and lightly sand it. Now what I like to do when I prepare my canvases that do have a rougher surface, I will actually apply two or three coats of gesso but I will sand in between each layer once it's dry. Usually by the third layer and again once that's lightly sanded, you've got a really nice smooth surface. Now you don't want it super smooth because the paint will struggle to adhere to the canvas. There is a little bit of a balance but the more that you paint on these surfaces you yourself as an artist will start to get a feel for how smooth you want that surface to be. And this gesso here, the Liquitex Professional, is the one that I've used in the white and I always apply that to my canvas boards or my wooden panels if they are my preference for that surface for the painting that I'm working on. The biggest tip when using this though is do make sure that each layer of the gesso you apply is completely dry before you paint on it or before you apply a second layer of gesso. Tip two and that is the canvas colour. Now most canvases you buy will look white where they've already been primed, they are absolutely ready to go but I find it's a lot easier to judge your values when you're working with a different colour other than white. So the colour that I choose to start with is going to vary depending on the subject that I am painting. This here was a canvas board and it was a fur focus study on Patreon of black short fur. So I decided to go down with more of a mid-tone darker grey here so that I could then easily judge the black fur that I needed to layer on top. If I had a tiger on the easel, I'd be doing more of a burnt umber, burnt sienna type base layer. The exact colour for this really doesn't matter, it's just that I like getting a solid colour down first and then I can put my outline on top of that. If my painting has a scenic background or a bokeh background, I always put that in first and then I add my subject on top. But I never work straight from the white canvas, again as I say, just because it can be a lot harder to judge your values. So that brings me on to tip three and that is to have an accurate outline. Now this is going to make our life so much easier throughout the painting process because we already know that our proportions and the perspective is correct right from the very beginning. My method of getting my outline on my surface is to use white transfer paper most of the time. You can get it in other colours but white is usually my go-to. This is my preferred method because canvases don't erase very well, they're not the cheapest of surfaces to buy either so I want to make sure that when I put my outline on my surface that it is accurate and ready to go. And if you are someone who likes to do your outline all by freehand then all I would be recommending is to do that on a spare sheet of paper and then put that on top of your transfer paper and use the same method. Tip 4 and that's to have a good base layer. I always take an extra couple of minutes during this stage to make sure that I get it looking as close to that reference photo as I can. And what I mean by that is I never put down one solid colour of, in this case, maybe a brown or a burnt sienna. I always map in the markings, the eyes, the nose, the ears, where the main sets of shadows and highlights are. Now I'm not focusing on the exact colour, I can adjust those later with glazes, but I do want to make sure that I'm hinting at my contrast, so my lights and my darks. This first layer is our foundation for our details and I think it makes for a much more realistic end result in that fur. The reason being I've already built up a fair amount of depth here by indicating at the fur direction with those brush strokes. It's therefore a lot easier to follow that reference photo when it does come to add in those fur details. 
So in the long run, when I make sure that I give those extra few minutes to this base layer, I am far more, uh, more motivated and I end up finishing that painting much more efficiently. All paintings will go through an ugly stage. It's part of the process where we can sometimes feel discouraged and we don't want to carry on. So I find by making my base layer as refined as this and adding those extra few minutes at this stage, it's already looking like that reference photo. You're then far more motivated to keep on going. So tip five, and that is to work from dark to light. And with acrylics, this is how I work pretty much all of the time. You can see here where I've continued to build up the fur on this red panda's face. I started off with my darker, richer oranges, and then I've built up my lighter fur from there. Now at this stage here, I've worked with more of my cream colours because I'm going to glaze my final orange vibrant colours on top at the end. Now this is one of the other reasons why I really do love working with acrylics. Because they dry so fast, you can get a painting done that much quicker. So tip six, and that's the brushes. So I like to use a mixture of different shaped brushes so that I can create more depth throughout the painting process. Something else to bear in mind as well though is although you've got the different brands and the different shapes, depending on how much pressure you put on that brush, you're going to get a, a difference of results. If you have a round shaped brush and you do chisel the end of that bristle there, you're going to be able to create some finer lines like what I'm working with here. Now I would recommend that when you're trying to paint long lines that are also fine, a liner brush like what I'm working with here works perfectly. But don't be tempted to use this kind of brush for all of the details. What can happen is all of your brush strokes start to look the same and then the painting can look a little bit flat. So throughout the different layers, as you're building up that depth slowly, alter the and vary the brushes that you are using. Tip seven, and that is the fur length, direction and thickness. Now this is something that I talk about a lot in all of my Patreon tutorials where the footage is considerably slower. How I have my hand positioned and how I'm holding the brush is going to vary depending on the type of brush stroke that I want to create. The fur direction is going to vary depending on the subject that we are painting. But it follows the underlying bone and muscular structure under the skin so we want to make sure that we get that really accurate to that reference photo. If we don't, what will happen is that animal will not look as much like that reference photo as it should, which is obviously not what we're going for. And following on from that is also the fur length and the fur thickness. If we make the brush strokes too long, we're going to then make it look like, for instance, on this horse here, that the face would be far furrier than what it should be. So the brush strokes are so important as well as that fur direction. Tip eight, and that is don't over blend. Now this is one of the most common things that can happen because acrylics can be quite tricky to get that soft out of focus look. It can be really easy once you've mastered that technique to then start over blending everything. Now there are two main ways that I like to blend with acrylics. One is to use a slightly damp brush. The other is to use a fine mist sprayer bottle. So in this cat eye snippet here, I am using the damp brush technique. So I am applying paint with one brush and then with a slightly damp but clean brush, I am using that to then blend and soften out those brush strokes. Now with this technique, there is a fine balance. You have too much water, you're going to completely erase those brush strokes. You don't have enough water on that brush and then nothing will happen. There won't be any blending at all. I do have a video here on YouTube showing you how to blend acrylic, so I'll link that in the description below if that's of interest. So the second method is to use a fine mist sprayer bottle, and you have two ways that you can use this. The first, like what I'm doing here, is I've sprayed a layer of the water down first, and then I'm applying the paint. Because that then makes that initial surface wet, you're going to be able to blend out your brush strokes within that layer of water. That's going to naturally create a very soft transition. But as this clip here continues, I then add the water with the fine mist sprayer in between my layers. By doing this technique, it means that you can keep this paint for, you know, wet for as long as you need, just like how you would with oils. I'm then using that larger mop brush to blend out these layers to get those nice soft edges. But this is where you can over blend and that's one of the most common things that can happen. So when you start to create that softened edge, then ease off with that blending brush. 
the degree of how much it requires to be blended is going to vary depending on the effect that you're trying to create but it's just really worthwhile to be quite considerate of that throughout the painting process by over blending it doesn't mean that you have ruined anything but it does mean that the painting process is going to be extended you just have to carry on layering a couple more times until you get the desired effect that you're after. One big tip if you are using a fine mist sprayer bottle for blending is to hold that bottle a fair decent distance away from your canvas. If you hold that too close you're just going to end up with far too much water on your surface and it will just run down. Wait for that to dry and then retry that technique. Tip nine, and that is your contrast. This is something I talk about a lot in every single tutorial because it is so important. I personally focus a lot more on my contrast rather than the exact color. And this side-by-side -side comparison shows the reason. So on the left is the finished photograph of my zebra painting and on the right is exactly the same photo, but I've reduced the contrast. But it's it just makes such a big difference. On the left, my whites are as bright as they need to be and my darks are as dark as they need to be. It's not the colour at all, there's quite a lot of teals that I've incorporated in the fur itself. But the main thing that's striking about the left version is that sharp contrast. On the right, it still looks like a zebra and it does look realistic, but it's not as eye-catching and that's because my contrasts are not as good. A good way of judging whether or not you've got your contrast accurate is to take a photograph of your painting, turn it into black and white and also turn your reference photo black and white and compare the two. If you think that your highlights need to be made a little bit brighter then you can go ahead and make those changes very easily. Now quite often it is that we haven't gone dark enough, we're too worried about going too dark in case we can't then lighten it. But with acrylics, as long as that layer is dry, we can just carry on building up those layers and lighten it back up if we need to. So tip 10 and that is the varnishing. Now one of the most common complaints that acrylics get is that the they fade. Well it's not that they're fading, it's just that some paints dry with a bit more of a matte finish. As soon as you varnish them you'll restore all of that lovely contrast and those colours because what the varnish will do is it makes that paint go back to how it looks when it's wet. Now there are a few different options you can use for varnishing. My preference is a gloss varnish because I want that paint to look like it's wet again. I do like how all of those colours, those highlights, the darks, they're just made that much more punchier by a really good gloss varnish. I use Liquitex Basics acrylic paint and they're known for drying with a matte finish so they do often get this complaint that they have faded which they haven't as I said it's just that they have dried. Now I like the fact that they dry with a matte finish because it makes them easier to photograph, there's less glare. So one big tip when you are varnishing your work is take good photographs before you varnish it and I also then do try and take some more once it's varnished, however given that you have put a shinier look to that painting it's much harder to get a good photograph without any glare. So always take photos before you varnish it just in case you can't get a good photo at the end. There are also many varnishes that you can pick, you've got the pour on ones that you can then brush over your artwork or the spray version. I personally like the spray version, there are a couple of downsides, obviously you need a very well ventilated room. The I just like how much it gives that nice even coverage so I do make sure that I apply it in all directions, top to bottom and then left to right to make sure that there are no patches but you want to make sure that your acrylic painting is completely dry before you varnish it and then again that your varnish is completely dry before you package up that painting or you put it away and store it. The varnish is obviously also going to protect that artwork from the environment in terms of dust and so on, so it's a really important part of the painting process. And the reason why I've incorporated varnishing within my 10 top tips is because it makes such a difference to what the fur looks like in your painting. One big tip just before I end this video is if you want to check what your contrast is going to look like when it is varnished, wait for your painting to dry and then get a large flat brush just with a little bit of water on and run that across your painting. That will put a fine layer of water over the top and show you then what it's going to look like once it's varnished. If you find that you're not happy with the colour or your contrast could be a little bit better, you can make those changes before going ahead and varnishing it. 
So I really hope this video was of use. Most of the clips I've used here, all of these slower tutorials are available on my Patreon. And as I said, I'll link that in the description below. I do also have a Patreon library on my website where you can see a full list of the tutorials that are available on Patreon as soon as you sign up. If you found this tutorial useful, I'd really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up because it really does help. And if you want to get notified of future content, hit the subscribe and the bell button. And I'm going to be uploading another video to YouTube at the weekend.